Good morning, church family. Happy Sunday. It is great to see you through the lens here. But remember, whether I see you through the lens or see you in person, you are part of the body of Christ at Sunrise Christian Fellowship. So thank you for being here. Hey, a couple of quick announcements before we just jump in and just praise and worship the Lord together. On October 22nd, see when is that? Oh, this coming Friday, we have what we call the Kids Night Out, where you can bring your children. So if you know anybody that has children, whether they come to this church or not, bring the children here to our CAC, which is the Christian Activity Center. You might know it as the gym. And you bring your kids there and Beth Ann and her staff of children's ministry people will love on your kids and have a great night of activity and fun. And, and then you as parents or uncles or aunts or whomever, then you can go out too and join grown-ups if you want. You can go do your own thing, but we're also going to have a group that, that Banning and Brittany are going to be uh, getting together at a vineyard here in Fallbrook, 1924. So that's October 22nd from 6 to 8 p.m. Put it on the calendar, spread the word. Also, here's what you need to spread the word for. We have a family that was going to help serve the less fortunate at the Bread of Life in Oceanside this coming Monday, as in uh, tomorrow. The family, the Lawsons, Mike and Julie and, and a couple of their boys, they, they have COVID and, and they can't go and help. Our, our John Nixon, who was exposed to that also, he's quarantining so he can't go. We have one of our elders that's going to oversee it, but we need a couple more people to go to the Bread of Life in Oceanside on Monday. So you'd meet here at the church and, and if you're feeling in the afternoon around 4 or 4.30 and then you go down to Oceanside together. So if you're sensing the Holy Spirit kind of saying it's your time to step up, email greg at sunrisefallbrook.com, ryan at sunrisefallbrook.com. Just get a hold of us because that's Monday as in tomorrow we need help. We need hands. We need, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus for these people in Oceanside, the Bread of Life. And let's see, what else do we have going on here? Oh, you know what? God is good all the time. And it's great to see you. And it's great that we get to worship together. And, and, and you know what? Let's do it now. Let, let's just sing out as Shaylee leads us. God bless you. See you soon.
Good morning, folks. Great to see you today. And we welcome our online community to worship uh, the Lord together. This is church for us. Uh, I invite you to take your Bibles now. We're in our series, and today we're looking at the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And then turn your Bible to one, Psalm 146. Psalm 146. The psalmist writes, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose hope is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Such an encouraging word today. You know, today, as I said, we're looking at the fourth beatitude in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Righteousness, you know, there is a biblical word and it's rich for sure, righteousness. But what exactly does it mean? When was the last time you heard someone say, you know what I'm thirsting for right now? You know what I want so much I can just taste it? A tall, cool glass of righteousness, right? That's what I'm thirsting for. My kingdom for a cup of cool, refreshing righteousness. Right, right. Haven't heard that lately. It's kind of hard to hunger and thirst for something if you don't even know what it means. Someone told me recently, when they hear this word righteousness, the first thing that comes to their mind is self-righteousness, a very negative image, not a positive one. But now let's step back for just a minute, you know, travel back in time with me and try to put yourself in the shoes of Jesus' original audience when he first preached this sermon. These were people at the bottom rung of the social ladder even though their holy temple still stood right there in the center of Jerusalem, their beloved country was occupied by the Romans. So they had no rights. They had no power. They were exiles in their own land. They had no say in the court of public opinion. They had no vote in the political realm. They were downtrodden and kicked around. They were cheated and taken advantage of. And every single day, they were constantly reminded that they were the losers and the hated Romans were the winners. In a culture that they no longer recognized and in a world that no longer welcomed them. So just think of that in your head. Can't you imagine them longing and thirsting for things to be different? for things to be made right again. Can't you imagine them yearning and praying every day for their broken lives and their broken world to be restored and mended once again? And then suddenly, along comes Jesus, this young, wonder-working rabbi, and instead of ignoring them or pushing them to the back of the line like everyone else does, here's what he says. Blessed are those who lack that's what he's saying. Blessed are those who hurt, who are empty and hopeless and oppressed in this world. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, for right paths, for right living, for a world made right and whole and equitable again, for you will be filled. That's what he's saying here. Folks, there's a name for this, and the Greek word for righteousness here bears this out. It's the word justice. Justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Dikaiosune in the Greek. 
That's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who are desperately starving for all the wrongs of this world to be made right again and for humanity itself to be made right with God and right with man, righteousness, for they will be filled. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is how fortunate are those who have suffered injustice and who now long with all their hearts for things to be made right. God has not forgotten you. That's his message. God, the very heart goes out to you. He is a God of justice and righteousness. And even if you've lost everything in the crooked courts of this world, the reign of God has come to vindicate his children. You know, what good news is that? Speaking of the Messiah, Isaiah had said, with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Okay, so that's all great. That's awesome and wonderful. But how exactly does this work? You know, the whole subject of justice is an extremely hot topic right now and very controversial, as we know. Today, everyone seems to be demanding justice, right? From the conservative right to the liberal left, from the Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter, and everybody else in between. Everyone wants justice done, passionately and desperately. But what does righteous justice actually look like when it's put into action? That's the question. And what does all this have to do with being rooted in Jesus in growing to Christian maturity? You know, as I was getting ready for this sermon, I was reminded of a dream that I had quite a while back. But I dreamt I was at a vending machine, buying a candy bar or something, when all of a sudden a stranger comes up behind me. He's very nice, he greets me very kindly. But then, in this dream, the next thing I know, he's grabbing me and throttling me and trying to steal all my stuff. He's a total crook and a thief. Well, being the very gentle, peace-loving guy that I am, I turned to him and very calmly I said, I will make your very brain explode right inside your head. That's what I said. I will make your brain explode. And then I took him by the neck and I started choking him and pummeling him and beating him into total submission. I was awesome. Yeah, I know that's kind of shocking. Listen, I was shocked too when I had this dream, but evidently you don't mess with me in my dreams. See, in my dreams, I'm one bad dude, and especially if you try to steal my candy. But you know, as crazy as this sounds, I want you to consider with me, is, is this justice? Is that what was going on, some form of justice in my dream? I mean, really, I know this is a gross oversimplification, but is this what justice is mainly all about? Punishing those who do wrong and making sure other people don't take what's rightfully yours. Folks, justice is a universal human conviction Deep down, we all want it. We all crave it. It's part of our very DNA and one of our country's core values. You know, every time we recite the Pledge of Allegiance, we're reminded of it. One nation under God, we say, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But again, what is justice? Does it simply mean that bad people must pay for their crimes? Or that everyone should get their fair share of the pie? Is that justice? Does it mean everyone should get what they rightfully deserve? Is that it? Does it simply mean using laws to fairly judge and punish crimes and criminals? Is that what justice is all about? You know, what do you think? And what would you say if someone asked you for your definition of justice? Listen, the cry for justice appears over and over again throughout the Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. We see it. The psalmist cries out, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. And why? Why should they do that? For he comes, the psalmist says, 
God comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness in the peoples in his truth. And in the book of Revelation, John has a vision. He has this vision of all those who have been brutally martyred and killed simply because of their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this is something we see accelerating all around the world, even now at this very moment. They called out with a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. It's a prayer for justice, isn't it? That's what we see in Revelation. It's a prayer that Almighty God would take action at last and make this suffering world of ours right and whole again, just as it was always meant to be from the very beginning. See, the fact is, all the prophets speak of that great day when the Messiah will come and bring justice to all the earth, Here is my servant whom I uphold, Isaiah says, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and what will happen? And he will bring justice to the nations. But listen to how he will do it. Listen to this. Unlike all the kings and dictators who force their will on people, you know, through sheer power and fear and military intimidation, and unlike all those today who angrily revolt by burning down stores and terrorizing cities, he will be gentle, Isaiah says. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush those who are weak or quench the smallest hope. He will bring full justice to all who have been wronged. Wow. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice, Isaiah says, and he will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. Awesome. See, we often tend to associate God's justice with his punishment or wrath, right? But it's so much more than that. It's actually profoundly concerned with redemption and restoration as well, in bringing deliverance to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Zion will be redeemed with justice, Isaiah says. And the Lord himself declares, my justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way and my arm will bring justice to the nations. There it is again. So yes, Biblical righteousness is truly about liberty and justice for all. You know, not just for me and my nation or for me and my special interest group or me and my individual rights, but for everyone. But don't miss this. Throughout the Bible, we also see what we could call a quartet of the vulnerable or those whom God is especially concerned about. This is a group of folks he particularly notices and marks out. I'm talking here about the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, and the poor. See, these are the ones who are disproportionately disadvantaged. They're vulnerable and oppressed, and God knows it. They're marginalized and mistreated, see, far more so or more often than many other groups. They have little social power or influence. Folks, these are the ones Jesus is largely addressing in this fourth beatitude. And he's not alone. Over and over again, the law and the prophets and those who are wise call for special protection for this particular quartet of the vulnerable. I mean, listen to this. In Deuteronomy, we read, Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow and all the people shall say, Amen. Deuteronomy 27, 19. And in Proverbs it says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. The prophet Zechariah declares, administer true justice. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. There they are again. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. 
And why is there such a major emphasis on doing justice on behalf of these vulnerable ones? Folks, because this is the very heart of our God. This is who God is. May our eyes be opened to see that today. Justice with a special concern for the vulnerable is based on the very nature and character of God himself. That's what Jesus is saying in this beatitude. All of you powerless ones, all of you defenseless ones, don't forget, don't despair. You are not cursed, he's saying. You are blessed. Even though you've been despised and abused by everyone else, God still sees you. God hears your cries for justice. He stands with you and for you, and he will satisfy the deepest desire of your heart. Again, in Deuteronomy, we read, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the almighty, and the awesome God, who shows no partiality and takes no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And then it goes on to say, Because of this, you too, as God's people, are to love those who are foreigners among you, for you yourselves were once foreigners in Egypt. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Folks, do we love the foreigners and the immigrants among us? Or do we just wish they would all go home to their own countries? And then think of that beautiful passage we read earlier from Psalm 146. The Lord executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. So let me ask you, you know, who does this sound like to you when I read that psalm? Anyone come to mind? You know, isn't this passage a graphic portrait of Jesus himself? The one who brings justice to the poor and who justifies the unjust through his own sacrificial death on the cross. Jesus is the righteous judge, the good and holy judge who's judged in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, Paul says, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, think of it like this. Throughout the Bible, the words justice and righteousness are linked together. You always see them together over and over again. When you see one of these words, you almost always see the other one. Justice or mishpat in Hebrew involves punishment for the guilty and protection for the innocent. It's about retribution for wrongdoers, yes, as well as reparations for victims. In other words, justice brings down those who step on others to get ahead, and it lifts up those who are stepped on. And meanwhile, the word righteousness, or tzedakah in Hebrew, is all about relationships. To put it simply, it means to be in right relationship with both God and people. Righteousness, to be made, to be made right. So righteousness is not just about my own private, personal morality or spirituality. It's certainly not about self-righteousness. This is a profoundly social word. It's what the world would look like if everyone truly loved God and loved their neighbor as themselves. So when we put these two words together, like the prophets do, we get the clearest picture of what Jesus meant when he spoke about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Folks, God's justice is profoundly relational. We need to remember that. It is never cold. It's never just the letter of the law. It's never mechanical or legalistic because at his very heart, God is love. So that means God's justice is always filled with mercy and love and deliverance. It's associated with all that is right and good and holy in contrast to all that is evil and wicked and dehumanizing in this world. Righteousness means loving God with all one's heart and soul through conformity to his word and his way. Justice, or mishpat, 
means promoting and securing the livelihood, well-being, freedom, and dignity of every person within your community, and especially those who are weak and vulnerable. You know, in the Hebrew mind, it's not primarily punitive. Justice is not primarily punitive. It's not simply about guaranteeing punishment for wrongdoers. It's more like a guarantee of well-being for all. What a wonderful thing. It's about bringing restoration and healing to places that were once marked by brokenness and alienation. See, this is the glorious blessing that Jesus is promising here in our beatitude. To practice justice means to actively care for the weak and the afflicted and the destitute and the oppressed, one person at a time. It's what Jesus' ministry is all about. Just think of how beautiful and world-changing it would be if all of Christ's followers would now go and do likewise. Doing justice means taking the time personally to meet the needs of the elderly, of those who are physically challenged, or the hungry in our neighborhoods. You know, it means treating every person as equals as someone who truly bears the very image of God. Folks, truly, it's amazing how just a short, simple little visit to Silvergate or the skilled nursing unit can bring such hope and joy to precious people who long for it. See, when Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, he made it clear that genuine justice means much more than simply punishing wrongdoers or avoiding contact with sinners. No, the kind of justice he proclaimed dares to enter into this world of sin and evil. Why? In order to bring a message of healing, compassion, and transformation. It refuses to run away in the face of suffering and injustice, but instead it runs out to meet it and defeat it through spirit-filled acts of kindness and advocacy and generous hospitality. Folks, justice means living out the good news that Jesus proclaimed in his hometown of Nazareth when he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. We could say to proclaim justice for those who have been treated unjustly. See, we do justice then whenever we give human beings their due as beloved creations of God. It means living a life of honesty, equity, and generosity for the sake of others in every aspect of our lives. Oh, folks, do you long for a life like that? You know, do you literally hunger and thirst for a world like that? Jesus says that those who do are blessed. You know, it's vital that we understand that justice is not just a nice concept or idea. It's not just a good optional activity that we can choose to practice or not practice as we see fit. It, no, it is central to what God is up to in our world and crucial to our very identity as Christ ones, Christians. Through Jesus Christ, God himself has come to grant justice to all those who have been treated unjustly. And so for us to fail to show the same type of justice or generosity to the poor and the marginalized is not simply a matter of selfishness or stinginess. Folks, it's a violation of God's grace. It's an act of sinful unrighteousness that has very serious consequences in the kingdom of God. In fact, this whole issue is so close to the heart of God that Jesus actually connects it to the final judgment at the end of the age. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And here are those familiar words, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. 
I was in prison and you came to me. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me, Jesus says. You did it to me. And by the same token, on the other hand, he says, whenever you failed to do one of these things to someone who was being overlooked or ignored, that was also me. You failed to do it to me. You know, Nicholas Wolster, uh, what's Wolterstorff, he's a renowned Christian philosopher. He says, slowly I began to see that the Bible is a book about justice. But what a strange and haunting form of justice. Not our familiar modern Western justice of no one invading one's right to determine one's life as one will. Rather the justice of the widow, he says, the orphan and the alien. A society is just, he says, when all the little ones, all the defenseless ones, all the unprotected ones have been brought back into community to enjoy a fair share in the community's goods and a standing in voice in the affairs of the community. Biblical justice, he says, is the shepherd leaving the corral to look for the hundredth one and then throwing a feast when one is found. Folks, in a world that often seems like a nightmare, this is God's dream for our planet. Think of it like that. Everywhere we look today, we see injustice, don't we? There's human trafficking, you know, young girls being kidnapped and abused in brothels. We see racism, sadly. We continue to see it. We see ecological, ecological disaster and immigrant children separated from their parents. We celebrate the arrogant and despise the meek. Everything is perverted and inverted and not the way it's supposed to be. We're surrounded by unchecked plagues and diseases, economic injustice and the oppression of the poor. But that's not all. Even in the midst of all this blatant evil, how many times do we humans seem so much more interested in looking out for our own needs rather than looking out for the needs of others? So we demand our rights. You know, we will not be denied. No one can tell us what to do. Even if it's best for the whole community, you cannot tell me what to do. And look out if you try. You know, we all said it as children, those magic words, that's not fair. That's not fair. We scream that. And weary parents continue to have this argument to this very day. But even now, folks, as adults, what do we do? When we don't get our way, you know, when we don't get what we think we have coming to us, we immediately sue people and take them to court. Or sometimes we even take the law into our own hands. We want justice, we say, and we want it now. But listen, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is bringing an end to this world's nightmare of sin and death. And he's replacing it with something brand new. He comes to judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in truth. What a stunning thing. What a profound need we have for that. And now he's calling us as Christians to join with him in this mighty revolution and to become a vital part of his dream come true. True justice it's all about the reversal of fortune that occurs when God sends his son into the world to make things right again. It's the song of joy that Mary sings when she first discovers she's pregnant with Jesus. Remember that? My soul magnifies the Lord, she cries, and my spirit exalts in God my Savior. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And then she goes on to list it. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, she sings, but has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Folks, how desperately we need to reimagine our world and see it as God sees it, because this is precisely what God means by justice. In a world that loves to celebrate the rich and the famous, those who have gained their wealth and power by exploiting and abusing others will be brought down from their thrones. That's the word of the Lord. While the poor and the victimized will be exalted and lifted up. See, this is the sacred promise of our beatitude today. 
Only those who are truly starving and thirsting for a world like this, for a world made right, can ever pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because this is precisely what the kingdom of God is all about. You know, Jesus says, all those who hunger and thirst after justice will be filled. That's what he's saying. They will be satisfied and satiated at last. He's talking about those on the margins, right? He's talking about the people who stand at the edges of society in need of care, but who rarely receive it because they're so easily overlooked. These are the ones who thirst for justice. These are the ones who have God's ear. You know, as we come to a close, think, think of the despised Canaanite woman. Remember that story in the Gospels? She comes to Jesus. She's desperately looking for help for her sick and suffering daughter. She wants that more than anything, more than food or clothing, more than life itself. She'll do anything. And yet as a pagan foreigner and as a woman, she knew she was very, very unlikely to receive any justice in this world. She knew she'd be treated like an unwanted dog. But Jesus comes to reverse the curse. Woman, he tells her, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And the Bible says her daughter was healed from that very hour. See, Jesus treated her with dignity and grace and respect. This is how God's dream of justice invades our world and continues to grow. Again, like a tiny little mustard seed planted and rooted in the ground, sprouting up to the heavens, one glorious tree at a time. I love how York Moore puts it in this wonderful book, Making All Things New. He says, the world we live in is caught between two worlds, a dream and a nightmare. But the good news is that the dream of God will come to pass and is coming to pass all around us. It will one day replace the nightmare of this world. In many ways, he says, God's dream is already breaking in. Folks, it is. That is so true. He goes on. Every time a well is dug for a community, food is provided for the hungry. Nets protect those at risk of mosquito-borne malaria or those who traffic in the flesh of prostitutes are brought to justice. The nightmare ends and the dream begins. When we join God in bringing his dream to the world around us, we are fulfilling his plan and purpose for our lives, he says. Joining in God's dream is the most significant thing we could ever do. It's what we were created for. God's plan for us begins and flourishes as we allow our dreams to merge into the great dream of God. God's dream, he says, and the dream at the core of our being goes beyond justice, beyond sustenance, beyond bare necessities. It's seen in lavish celebration, in exquisite beauty, and in full and lasting peace. This is what we will see as we journey together into the dream of God. Folks, I'm so excited about the way God is bringing his great dream to pass, even right here at Little Sunrise. We still have so much to learn. Oh my goodness, we have so much to, more to put into practice. But every time we dare to do little things with great love, because we ourselves have been loved, you know? Every time we reach out to feed the hungry at the bread of life, every time we visit the sick in the hospital or sponsor an orphan in Malawi, or simply make friends with the friendless. Every time we do such things, we participate in God's glorious justice. And the world is brought just a little bit closer into the arms of our Savior and into the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a world made right again with God and with one another, for their hunger will be satisfied. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Father God, we thank you again. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this, this illumination of truth that sets us free when we surrender to you. So holy God, we thank you that your eye truly is on the vulnerable ones. May we see as you see. Lord, help us too to long hunger and thirst for a world made right with you. That's what righteousness is all about, to be right with you and right with others. Come Holy Spirit, transform our lives so that we might be like Jesus. For we pray in his holy name, amen.